the hardest nations on the planet to invade. I'm sure that you all know military operations are hard to plan. Even the slightest oversight can lead to disaster, and there's a lot of factors to consider. Everything from distances, supply lines, terrain, weather conditions, and even civilian populations all have to be taken into account. No nation is impossible to invade, but there are some that are much more of a headache than others. The United States Today, the United States possesses the most powerful military in the world, with defense spending outstripping the next 10 nations combined. Of the 47 aircraft carriers and helicopter carriers used worldwide, 20 belong to the U.S. Navy, with their closest rival floating five, and when divided by branch of service, it has the first, second, fourth, and seventh largest air forces in the world. In light of this, any attempt to invade the United States is unlikely in the extreme. Even without such a powerful military, launching an invasion would not be an easy proposition. Perhaps the greatest defense the United States has to protect itself from being invaded is its location. The nation is bordered on the east and west by thousands of miles of open ocean, any rival nation or power block that could feasibly threaten the U.S. would have the monumental logistical task of supplying a force sufficient enough to subdue the third largest nation across endless miles of trackless water. Even the isolated state of Hawaii is a tiny dot in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, thousands of miles from any mainland, and supplying an invasion force would be a titanic undertaking for such a small territory. Should the logistics challenge be overcome, the topography of the U.S. would make any invasion difficult at best. The largest state of Alaska is gigantic. At over 663,000 square miles, most of it lacking any real infrastructure or population centers, and covered in forests and mountain ranges that are difficult to traverse, and can experience winters with temperatures dropping well below freezing during the winter. The lower 48 states have their own geographic challenges as well. Covering over 3 million square miles of territory, the size alone is a daunting task for any army. The Pacific Northwest is covered in dense forests that are difficult to navigate, while the Southwest is home to scorching deserts where temperatures can reach 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Separating the West Coast from the interior is the rugged Rocky Mountains, whose narrow passes are perfect choke points to stall an invader. The Great Plains are vast expanses of wide-open territory subject to severe weather conditions, mainly in the form of tornadoes, suffering more than the rest of the world combined. The southeast is filled with swamps and marshland that can bog down any invader, while the east coast is shielded by the Appalachian mountain range, which are not as rugged as the Rockies, but are still a formidable barrier, and filled with countless caves and mines that could house hidden insurgents. The northeast is heavily urbanized, turning the sprawling metropolitan areas into so many Stalingrads to grind down an invader. In addition to the geography, the population itself is a defense. With over 300 30 million people, the United States is the third most populated nation on the planet and is by far the most heavily armed. With an estimated 120 guns for every 100 citizens, there are an estimated 400 million firearms and trillions of rounds of ammunition in private hands. Should even a fraction of these people fight in an invasion scenario, they would still overwhelm any possible invader with a sheer weight of numbers. All of these factors combined mean that a direct invasion of the United States is almost certain to fail even if the overwhelming might of the U.S. military is not brought to bear. Switzerland Today, the small central European nation of Switzerland is best known for its perpetual neutrality. It has held this policy for over 500 years and was confirmed in 1815 with the Congress of Vienna, which ended the Napoleonic Wars. After sitting on the sidelines while nations fought bitterly around them, Switzerland is better known for its chocolate and ski resorts than military prowess. Any potential invader, however, should keep in mind that the seemingly placid attitude towards international affairs belies a very different reality. Geographic 
geographically, Switzerland is in the middle of the Alps mountain range, a geographic feature that is, at best, difficult to traverse, even with modern military equipment. Avalanches and landslides are a constant danger and are capable of stopping any invading army in its tracks. Much like Hannibal crossing the Alps to attack Rome, any invading army would be forced to negotiate narrow mountain passes, where one wrong move could send the hapless victim plummeting to their death. Any advance would have to be slow, cautious, and methodical, meaning that speed and mobility would be greatly hampered. These narrow passes, as well as tunnels and other passages through the mountains, create perfect choke points. Any advantage in numbers would be negated, with the Swiss able to hold off large numbers of enemies with minimal forces. While they are politically neutral in global affairs, it is very much an armed neutrality. Since 1880, Switzerland has created a large and complex series of defenses capable of repelling any foreign invasion. Using the rugged alpine terrain to their advantage, the National Redoubt, as it was known, turned the seemingly tranquil nation into a virtually impregnable fortress. The exact makeup of this defense system has changed over the years, being constantly upgraded based on technological advancements, changes in military doctrine, and potential geopolitical threats. The Redoubt consists of over 8,000 hidden bunkers and storage depots, often situated at strategic mountain passes, turning already difficult to traverse terrain into a chain of citadels that would have to be laboriously cleared one at a time. During the Second World War, over fears of a German invasion, over 2,000 tunnels, bridges, and other points of infrastructure were rigged with explosives, set to detonate to stop any advance. During the Cold War, many of these structures were still set with explosives. And even into the 21st century, many bridges connecting to the outside world were prepared for detonation cutting off Switzerland from any hostile neighbors. There has been a push to deactivate them in recent years, but should the geopolitical climate change, they can be rewired as necessary. In response to potential nuclear fallout during the Cold War, Switzerland enacted a shelters-for-all policy. Since 1963, any new homes or apartment complexes must either have a fallout shelter dug underneath it, or the owner of the building must pay for the use of a public shelter. Over 300,000 shelters were carved into the picturesque landscape, with both space and supplies to protect the entire Swiss population for extended periods of time. These were maintained during the Cold War as fallout shelters, should a general nuclear exchange consume Europe. In recent years, many of these measures have been decommissioned, given the stability of Western Europe, with many of the bunkers repurposed as museums, hotels, and even cheese-aging facilities. Though if needed, they can be recommissioned back to their original purpose, and the mandate of new homes with built-in shelters has for the most part been relaxed. There are enough bunkers and fallout shelters to house the entire Swiss population should a catastrophe strike. In addition to the natural and man-made defenses, the Swiss population itself would prove a challenge to any invader. In spite of not participating in a foreign war in centuries, the nation maintains a mandatory conscription. All able-bodied Swiss men are required to perform military service upon turning 18, though conscientious objectors can opt for civil service. Women are not conscripted, though they can join the military if they choose. In order to ensure rapid deployment of forces, those in the army keep their service rifles with them at home. They can even buy the weapons after their service for a modest fee. To keep their skills sharp, target shooting is a popular pastime with gun ranges located throughout the country. This means that an invader, once they overcome the dangerous terrain, explosive infrastructure, and hidden bunkers, will have to contend with a nation in arms that treats target shooting as a pastime. The Swiss didn't always have a peaceful reputation. Starting in the 15th century, Swiss pikemen revolutionized warfare in Europe, and Swiss mercenaries were highly sought after. Monarchs around the continent would pay high prices to maintain Swiss regiments. Uh, sorry about this. Where was I? Oh yeah. So, this tradition continues today as the Papal Swiss Guard, which is considered the smallest professional army in the world. Don't let the uniforms fool you, they aren't just for show. Uh. I know one of the reasons I get so many spam texts and calls is because big companies can't keep our data safe.
Recently, AT&T revealed that nearly all their customers' call and text records had been exposed in a massive data breach. And it hasn't even been a few months since they admitted over 70 million of their users' social security numbers ended up on the dark web. The stolen logs also contain a record of every number AT&T customers called or texted. So even if you don't use AT&T, if someone who texted you did, then your number has been exposed too. So, what can you do to protect yourself? Well, be like Switzerland and have the best protection available, like Aura, who are the sponsors of today's video. Aura alerts me if they find that my phone number or any other sensitive information has been compromised, and they give me fast fraud alerts if anyone tries to use that data to access my credit or bank accounts. Aura does so much more to keep me and my family and my friends safe. I also get things like transaction monitoring, a VPN, antivirus, a password manager, parental controls, and identity theft insurance. I get this all in one app at one affordable price, and you can too. I can also get their AI-powered call assistant that will pick up unknown calls on my behalf to screen them for spam or scams. And it protects me from harmful text messages by filtering out known spam numbers and scanning links in the messages for phishing threats. I'm not going to leave myself vulnerable to data breaches. And if you don't want to either, click the link in the description below or go to Aura.com slash Simple History and try your first two weeks for free. Thanks Aura for sponsoring this video. Now on to… Russia. Incidentally, invading Russia is not a particularly difficult task, at least on paper. Though the landmass of Russia is full of difficult terrain features, such as swamps, dense forests, and arid deserts, the borders of Russian territory are not guarded by these natural boundaries. To the west, the European plain, a stretch of land from the Pyrenees to the Urals, consists of the largest stretch of mountain-free land in Europe. Much of this land was covered in dense forests, though much of these have been cleared for agriculture and human development. To the east, the Asiatic steppe likewise stretches as a clear open path from eastern China to Romania. There are some boundaries in these regions, such as rivers, highlands, and other difficult terrain, though nothing as substantial as the Alps or other large mountain ranges. Any invader could simply walk into Russia's heartland. And this is exactly why Russia has proven so difficult to control. In the words of German Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt, the vastness of Russia devours us. Over one-eighth of the landmass of the planet is Russian territory. Because of this, any invader can walk into Russia, and they'll continue to walk, and walk, and walk, with seemingly no end. Logistics networks, the heart of any military campaign, will be stretched to the breaking point as supply caravans would have to traverse endless open spaces. Living off the land would become difficult, as Russian forces have historically utilized scorched earth tactics to deny the invaders resupply. Though they cannot fall back indefinitely, as was stated in Joseph Stalin's infamous Order No. 227, the vast expanses do give Russia a tremendous amount of leeway when planning defenses of their homeland. The weather conditions found in Russia are also renowned for helping to stop invaders. Though summers can be scorching, problems for invading armies begin in autumn. Heavy rains will turn the land into quagmires, sinking vehicles and men alike, slowing rapid advances to a crawl. It was the winters, however, that have gained a legendary reputation. Temperatures can plummet rapidly, and heavy snowfall can blanket the ground, grinding the pace of invaders to a halt. Exposed skin becomes susceptible to frostbite, with hypothermia becoming a rampant issue among the soldiers. And in more modern times, vehicles would fail to operate in such frigid temperatures. Logistics systems already strained by the incredible distances would snap, and invaders would have no choice but to try and withdraw. How then did the Mongols manage to defeat Russia and conquer its territory? The Mongol heartland, located on the Asian steppe, has similar conditions to Russia, so the freezing winters were not unusual. More importantly, however, they had no real logistics system to rely on. Each Mongol warrior was a mounted cavalryman with multiple remounts available. They could move rapidly, their horses living off the grasslands and the Mongols themselves would live off the land, even subsisting on blood from their own horses when necessary. Russia at this time was also not a unified nation, but rather a collection of rival principalities and were unable or unwilling to offer a united front against a common enemy. Once in power, after sacking several cities and massacring the citizens, the 
Mongols ruled over the Russian lands through a system of tribute. Local rulers would be left in place under Mongol control and would have to pay tribute to their overlords. This system lasted for two centuries until 1480. The Russians, led by Ivan III, were able to overthrow the so-called Mongol Golden Horde. Great Britain While the rest of Europe has seen armies march across the continent in countless wars over the centuries, Great Britain has not seen a major invasion from a foreign power in almost a thousand years. There have been no shortage of conflicts, from civil wars to raids to foreign-based coups, but not since the Norman invasion of 1066 has a foreign army successfully landed on and taken over the country, apart from the glorious revolution of 1688, when William of Orange had widespread support for his invasion and faced very little opposition. So this is a notable exception. The reason for this is as significant as it is obvious. Britain is surrounded by water, specifically the English Channel to the south, the North Sea to the east, and the Irish and Celtic Seas to the west. The distances in these waterways are not vast. In fact, at their narrowest, the Strait of Dover, the distance separating Dover from the French port of Calais is about 20 miles, close enough to see on a clear day. Though not insurmountable, like a moat protecting a castle, invaders have no choice but to overcome this obstacle. Any attempt to land on and control the British Isles relies on one key factor more than any other – naval superiority. In times past, when a successful invasion was launched, the invaders had a clear advantage in ships and were able to control the waves between Britain and the rest of Europe. This was the case with the Romans, the Saxons, Norse, and Normans, who faced little opposition on the waves. It would not be enough to simply land on Britain's shores, however. Should an army land, they could easily be cut off and destroyed should they lose control over the tenuous lines of communication connecting them to the mainland. This concept has been the mainstay of England, and later Great Britain's national defense. Even with a navy opposing them, many have tried to invade the British Isles. In 1588, the Spanish and their famed Armada launched about 130 ships against the English. After being harassed by the English fleet, the Spanish Spanish panicked when they were attacked by fire ships, scattering in the confusion and becoming easy targets, suffering severe casualties. During the Napoleonic era, Napoleon assembled a large army with transports and naval escorts to make the crossing of the English Channel, planning on conquest. These plans were dashed when on October 21, 1805, the Royal Navy, under command of Admiral Horatio Nelson, smashed the combined French and Spanish fleet at the Battle of Trafalgar. With this defeat, any hope Napoleon had of conquering Britain were permanently dashed. In the 20th century, control over the seas would not be enough. Air superiority was also a must for any successful invasion attempt. After conquering large portions of continental Europe, Nazi Germany drew up plans for a potential invasion of Britain. This would not be as simple as making the crossing with a few wooden boats to overthrow the ruling elite, as had been the case in 1066. Instead, plans were made to land 260,000 troops across the south of England, using hundreds of barges and boats. As a prelude, the Germans launched a concentrated effort to destroy the RAF, while the invasion flotilla assembled. Though they inflicted heavy losses, the Luftwaffe was unable to destroy the RAF. Lacking air superiority and facing the still formidable Royal Navy, as well as ever-strengthening coastal defenses, the invasion, dubbed Operation Sea Lion, was postponed indefinitely. This was the last major threat of a direct invasion of Great Britain. While not impossible, the complexities of modern warfare require total control over air and sea before any possible invasion can be considered. A lot of people have tried to swim in the English Channel, including an 11-year-old. It's no easy feat, however. There are treacherous currents, brutal weather conditions, and the occasional jellyfish to make things difficult. But for those determined to prove themselves, the risks are worth it. You know what? I'm taking the channel next time. Afghanistan Afghanistan has earned a reputation as the graveyard of empires. 
For centuries, many world powers have tried to exert their will on this landlocked Central Asian nation, with at best mixed results. While actually invading the country is not impossible and has been done numerous times throughout history, actually controlling it afterwards is an entirely different matter. Earlier on in history, the area that is now Afghanistan was already causing issues for invaders such as Alexander the Great, whose advance to the east was slowed down considerably by the tribes in the region. After the collapse of the Maurya Empire of India, Afghanistan's population increased, and it would soon gain a reputation as a land difficult for outsiders to control. One of the first major incursions into Afghanistan would be by Islamic armies in the 7th century AD, and these would fail miserably, representing one of the first major setbacks for the meteoric rise of Islam. The Mongols, on their way to conquering the largest land empire in history, subdued the region, often slaughtering entire populations populations to achieve this. The region would then be contested by the Mughals and the Safavids. Both of these powers would face numerous revolts, the Mughals able to control major urban areas and essentially bribing tribal chieftains to keep the peace, and the Safavids' demise was closely associated with an Afghan uprising. In later centuries, a similar pattern emerged. The British Empire fought three separate wars in Afghanistan, which resulted in one of the worst defeats a European nation suffered at the hands of an indigenous force in the 19th century. In the 20th century, the Soviet Union invaded the nation and were ground down with an unrelenting guerrilla war. And a few decades later, in response to the 9-11 terrorist attacks, the United States became embroiled in a two decades long conflict, which failed to oust the ruling Taliban from power. There are numerous reasons why Afghanistan is so difficult to conquer. Foremost is the terrain. The region is highly mountainous, making operations difficult at best. Furthermore, these mountains are riddled with countless cave complexes, which can harbor enemy fighters. These labyrinthine structures would have to be cleared or collapsed one at a time, a virtually impossible task even with modern technology. Because of the mountainous terrain, the rural settlements tend to be insular and have formed a complex web of relationships among themselves that outsiders have difficulty navigating. For example, there are 14 recognized ethnic groups in Afghanistan, and these themselves are divided into numerous smaller subgroups and tribes. If an invader tried to appeal to one clan, they may alienate another, compounding the difficulties already inherent in invading the country. Many of these clans will fight among each other and as a result, many villages, especially in the northern and western portions of the country, are defended with structures called kalas, which translates to fortress or fortified place, which are usually made from mud brick or stone. Most invaders did manage to control the major urban areas such as Kabul and Kandahar, but in order to control the majority of the country, they will be forced to contend with isolated and heavily fortified villages spread across inhospitable mountainous terrain with limited infrastructure such as roads or rail networks to face a formidable force of inhabitants who can withdraw to the countless cave systems to continue the fight later. For many invaders, this is not worth the effort, and many have learned the hard way why Afghanistan is called the Graveyard of Empires. Okay, so the whole Graveyard of Empires thing might be a bit overstated. There are a whole host of factors as to why a nation rises and falls, and something as simple as the invasion of Afghanistan is not the only reason. It's ironic, though, that any military campaign in that Central Asian nation is almost always doomed to failure. So there you have it. Any nation can be invaded, and war is anything but predictable. But there are some nations on the planet whose geography, population, or other circumstances makes them virtually impossible to invade, and planning an operation within their borders will cause more than their share of headaches.